Hello and welcome to episode 29 of series 2 of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. So we're getting towards the end of Series 2 of the podcast. Next week, or next the next episode, which is episode 30 of this series, on the 23rd of November, will be the final episode of this particular series of the podcast. And that's an interview with Jen Sproul from the IOIC. Jen is the lead of the IOIC, and Jen is going to be telling us all about what we've learned in internal communications and in engagement in 2021 and summing up quite nicely I think some of the lessons from 2021 and looking into 2022 what can we expect what are some of the things that the IOIC are going to be prioritizing and looking at and consequently what are we as an, an internal communications and employee engagement communicate community going to be looking at as well so that's what we've got coming up on the 23rd of November after that what we're planning to do is to put together a few shorter what we're calling magazine episodes and what we'll be doing there they, these won't be fresh new interviews but what we're going to do is curate some parts of previous podcast interviews where we we have common themes, things that have been talked about across different interviews in different contexts and curate those together into some shorter magazine episodes for you to listen to. So you're still going to be getting the podcast appearing on your your podcast flow, on your podcast stream, whatever, however you listen to the podcast, but it won't be uh, fresh single interview programs. It's going to be shorter 15, 20 minute episodes with me just, just knitting together a few different parts of interviews from the earlier in the uh, si- series two and series one so i hope you hope you'll find that of value we will be back in in january 2022 with a new series of the podcast and some fresh interviews for you and on that note if you have any particular topics that you'd like us to cover anything you're really passionate about anything you'd like to learn more about in within the the internal communications and employee engagement sphere, obviously, please let us know. If you go to engagingic.com, there is a form there where you can either anonymously or you can tell us who you are, tell uh, tell us what it is you'd like us to cover. If there's any particular topics that you think that that we could cover that you'd find interesting, or conversely, if you yourself would like to appear on the show, if you'd like to be an interviewee on the show and you have something that you'd like to share with our community and you think it will be of value, then let us know what that is. Get in touch with us again at engagingic.com via the feedback form or the co- the comments form there and let us know what it is that you're looking to uh, you'd be looking to talk about or that we ask that it is informative it's not just purely self-promotional um, um and but any within that and it is, if it's relevant to our community we'd always be interested to hear what what you have um so that's all for the podcast and again if you've got any questions or comments about that please get in touch with us at engagingic.com the only other thing to let you know is that we have one of our own events coming up in the near future which is on the 2nd of december at 3 p.m in the afternoon uk time and that is one of our free webinars this time it's all about health and safety communications how do we make our health and safety communications more engaging more compelling and less dull Um, and that can be health and safety in its broadest context so we're looking at mental health we're looking at well-being we're looking at the broadest context of health and safety there and what we found is we found some really interesting ways to make health and safety a much more engaging topic than it normally is so not just powerpoints and gory videos some real interactive uh, engaging and also to a certain extent some fun as well which we, we found is a really powerful way to get people engaged as long as it's appropriate fun of course so if you'd like to find out more about that and how you or your colleagues can make your health and safety communications more engaging then jump across to do the uh, our website which is thebigpicturepeople.co.uk. Go to our events tab at the top of the, the, the menu or on the menu. And if you go down to the first event that's listed under our events, you'll find on the 2nd of December, there you have our Transforming Health and Safety Communication and Training webinar, which is totally free. You can sign up there. It'll take you to a link on Zoom where you can sign up and you will keep you in the loop as to what's happening and when uh, we'll send you a link that you can use to be able to join the webinar. Uh, we have another event coming on up as well in in January but I'll tell you all about that on the next episode episode 30 uh, in a couple of weeks time anyway that's enough of me let's get on to today's interviewee 
During my career, I've been fortunate enough to work in a number of areas within organisations, including learning and development, organisational development, internal communications, and also people management when I used to manage teams of people. Um, and one of the things that I've I've seen throughout my career is obviously a significant amount of organisational change. That that is that's been one of the, I guess one of the obvious uh, things that we're all familiar with at the moment, and have been for the last twenty thirty years of of the amount of change that we've seen within organisations. However, what what I wanted to do was look at the explicit link between internal communications and organisational change, because from my experience, organisational change mainly boils down to people. Um, being able to take people with us on that journey that we're asking them to embark upon whenever we implement a new system, a new process, a new strategy, new vision, new values, all of those sorts of things that we we get involved with. So exploring the linkage between organisational change and effective communications, uh, as I said, is something that's long overdue on the show. But I also wanted to approach it from the angle of um, some some valid research, some valid evidence as to as to what those connections are. So I was very fortunate to be able to get the interviewees uh, on today's show, who you're going to be hearing from in a moment, uh, who have authored recently authored a very uh, important work. I think a really important work, uh, which will, will uh, help to fill a gap that I think that currently exists within in the uh, internal communication space when it comes to strategic communication and how that links to organisational change. So they're going to be telling us all about that connection between change and internal comms, what we as internal communicators need to be focusing on and how we need to be building our change management capabilities, not just our internal communications capabilities. We're going to look at the importance of effective storytelling and how it, storytelling is actually one of the, the major tools that we can use when it comes to communicating organisational change. And then we're going to look at, again, at a theme that we've, we've talked about on other shows in the past, this idea that if we want to be a trusted advisor, we need to be catching our, our leaders early in their careers and demonstrating to them the importance of internal communications in order that they will will carry that with them and will be able to represent that importance uh, in their decisions that they make further down the line. So a really, really uh, fantastic interview today with two guests for a change, something we've not done before, uh, and one that I hope you will find as interesting as I did. Mark Dollins is president of North Star Communications Consulting. Mark's previous corporate experience spans more than 30 years with Fortune 500 companies like DuPont and PepsiCo. John Stemmel is Chair and Professor of Strategic Communication at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. His primary interests involve health-related community-based participatory research and messaging through storytelling and narrative. Mark and John are the co-authors of Engaging Employees Through Strategic Communication, which is a brand new book which also serves as a modern day guide for employee communication. So Mark and John, welcome to the podcast. It's wonderful to speak to you. Where are you both based at the moment? Because I know you're not in the same locality at the moment. Where are you? Where are you, Mark? Let's start with you. Absolutely. And uh, thanks so much for chatting with us today, Craig. Uh, I'm located in a little town called Ridgefield, Connecticut. We're about an hour north of uh, the north side of uh, Manhattan in New York City. And, um, and John, I'll let you explain where you are. Yeah, uh, thanks, Craig, for having us. Uh, I am in Columbia, Missouri, kind of smack in the middle of the state between St. Louis and Kansas City and home of the University of Missouri. Wow, wonderful. And uh, yeah, it's always great. I think for, I mean, I, I think with Manhattan, everybody knows where that is uh, in, in this side of the pond anyway, with, with our sort of European audience. And, uh, and, and, and sort of if we were to draw a map of the uh, United States, John, and I stood sort of which bit would it be is in the middle, the, the, the right hand side, the left hand side, the bottom bit? I, my, my US geography is not great. So uh, Columbia is almost exactly in the center of the state of Missouri. Yeah. Uh, almost exactly in the center of the entire country. In okay. So you're in the, the United States. You're in the center of uh, the center of gravity, as it were, for the for the U.S. So, <laughs> as, as for, for, yes, I, I would say we're. Uh, I, I guess if growing up on the East Coast, this would be called flyover country. Okay. Right. Fantastic. Excellent. So, 
let's I've, I've given you a brief introduction there um i'd love to know and then the listeners i'm sure would love to know a little bit more about your work and also the book so uh do you want to just give us a little bit bit maybe a little bit more information about about your own work and then let, let's talk uh, collectively about the book and the, where the book came from and what the book's all about and what who's it who is it for so who, who wants to start off in terms of your your work and uh, and what your primary interests are at the moment sure i, I can start out um so, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a professor in the uh, School of Journalism. Uh, I teach primarily uh, public relations and advertising classes. Uh, I teach our beginning public relations class. I teach our capstone class where students get to actually work on campaigns for clients and put together um, advertising plans that are that are utilized. Uh, we work with groups like Fox Sports and we're working with Warner Media this semester. We work with a whole bunch of different uh, entities, both local, national, sometimes international. And uh, research-wise, I, I do a lot of work in health communication and science communication, trying to talk about the way messages are disseminated, uh, mm. ways to end miscommunication, uh, and then with with storytelling. How exactly do you tell these complicated? Um, technical stories in a way that the public can understand. Mm, excellent, and I'll, I'll, we're going to come on to that later on because that's that's definitely linked to the to the topic that we're going to be looking at. Um, thank you, John and Mark. We, a little bit more about your work and, and what you're up to at the moment. Sure. So um, I left the uh, the corporate world. Actually, I left it twice, uh, but I was called back in. But um, my consultancy these days is really focused on two areas. One is employee and change communications. Um, and the other area is communications talent development. So I work with clients to help uh, help them uh, articulate the competencies that are, are needed in their communication practice and take a look at the talent that's there and how we can create development plans plans for the folks who are a part of their organizations. But, uh, you know, really, when you think about the, the bulk of my career and the bulk of the work that I've done, even though I've worked in external communications, media relations, crisis communications, I've run uh, foundations and community um community outreach programs. The one consistency that I had in all of my corporate uh, work has been uh, a focus on employee communications. So mm -hmm. um, as we think about the work uh, that went into the book, it really, I believe, is the culmination of what I've learned in my 35 plus years in, uh, in the world of employee communications and what research tells us work, which is why John has been such an amazing partner to work with me on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah, that leads us nicely onto the book, and 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 uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've 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 had a, a chance. I know it's not in, available in the UK at the moment. You very kindly shared some uh, a few pages with me with, to to have a look through, and it's really a really thorough piece of work. Uh, you know, fantastic. And thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, do you want to just give give us a quick overview outline of how the book's structured and and how you envisage uh, readers using it? Yeah. So it was. Um it was a case where Mark and I sat down and, and he, I mean, his experience is unparalleled and, and he brought just, he brought the heart to the book is, is mm. kind of the way I think about it. Uh, and so we wanted a book that would work both if you were a practitioner in the field, as well as a student trying to get into the field. Mm. And so it's set up, it's set up in a, in a textbook kind of format. So, you know, we start out with, Here's what the book's about, a little bit about history. We go into ethics. We And then we kind of talk about different elements of the job, competencies, storytelling, uh, measurement, um, and then kind of end the book with where exactly, talk about change elements within the industry. And then where is the industry going? Yeah, yeah. And like I said, it's, it's a really nice mix of all of Mark's experiences, everything he's learned in his decades in the field. And then we bring in a lot of, a lot of research. So everything that we say has been validated through studies over the years. So we, we, we think it's a really nice balance. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and I think, you know, I, I def I agree. And I, as I said to uh, Mark, when we originally spoke, I think there was a, there's a lot of work going on in the, in the UK and in Europe at the moment with, I'm involved with the Institute of Internal Communications. They're doing a whole thing around, you know, the pro professionalization of IC and, and really kind of raising the, 
the, the bar in terms of the competency models and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of interest in that. And I think I can see uh, that, you know, that's definitely uh, a gap at the moment. I think I don't, I've not seen a, 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 a work as comprehensive as the one you've set out anyway. So I really, really, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, as I say, it's a great, uh, it's a great piece of work and, and long overdue. So, um, fantastic. Um, We'll talk. Maybe we'll talk a bit more about the book as we as we talk about the, the the through as we go through the rest of the interview. And and I think really we've got so much breadth of experience, metaphorically anyway, around the table. There's so much we could we could we could talk about. But but I think for the for this interview, I really want to focus on an area that we've not covered in the in the sixty or so episodes thus far, and that's the the real explicit connection between organizational change and internal communications. And, and uh, as we kind of talked in the, in the preamble, we were just before we started recording, we were talking about change and it's, it's, it's certainly something that I, I came to, or, or I came to internal comms because of an involvement in change rather than, you know, I kind of was doing internal comms and realized a lot of it was about change. I think the two for me anyway, are, are kind of almost intrinsically linked, but I'd be really interested to, you know, get with your view on why why are we talking about organizational change and internal comms in the same breath breath and and what what else, what is it that makes these disciplines so closely connected with each other and so essential for each other? I guess I don't know who'd like to start on that. I can I can start on this one. It, it's something Mark and I have talked about a lot, and it's really we're talking about the last twenty years may have seen more change in the industry than the previous century. Mm. Um, and it's it's everything from stakeholder expectations to customer needs, uh, employee growth. Uh, you know what exactly do shareholders want from from a from a company? It's so it, it's it's from every possible direction. And then you throw in the other change, the the technical changes. Uh, everything from the rise of the internet and social media. To you know, AI and blockchain or block blockchain. So mm. it, we're talking about a case where um, the one constant in the industry is change right now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, absolutely. And I think you no, know, not more than the last eighteen months, where I think we've probably managed to compress about four or five years worth of change into <laughs> into a, a third of the time, if not more. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 so yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any denying that, that there's been a phenomenal and uh, you know this kind of exponential increase and you know the whole VUCA acronym of, of, of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, connecting that then to the comms, the comms arena and the professionalized uh, professionalization of internal communications and the link between internal comms and and change. Mark, do you want to pick up on that? Well, as John said, um, it's change is central to everything that we're doing these days. And whether a company is going through digital transformation or, to your point, uh, Craig, new work arrangements as yeah. a result of the pandemic, cultural change, you know, the traditional, even the traditional merger and acquisition kinds of activity, th they're not going away. In fact, it's only going to gain in volume and in scale. So what we see happening is that general managers and our HR partners are jumping in the deep end, I think, with both feet in terms of learning about change management and practicing mm. it. Mm. And I always want to draw the distinction between change management and change management communications. Mm. I think uh, many of us in the world of employee communications have been pulled in at times to say, hey, we have this thing that's changing and we need you to, to communicate it. And you know, more often than not, we communicators become the change management drivers because there isn't a change management uh, discipline that exists mm -hmm. within our organizations. That's changing and it's mm -hmm. changing very, very quickly where, as I said, we have HR, we have general managers who are getting certified in various change management competencies. And when they look to connect with communications these days, more often than not, they're finding communicators um, in the function that don't fully understand the discipline of change management mm -hmm. and how communication threads through it. So we cover that in the book. We, we talk about the different models. We talk about the importance of, of partnering, the need to get educated in these disciplines, um, certified if that's available, so that we understand the tools, we can speak the, the language of change management practitioners. So we have to understand what our partners are saying when they say things like ADCAR, which is um, an acronym used in the ProSci change management model, mm -hmm. stands for awareness, 
desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement, or whatever model that the enterprise is using, when we as communicators understand these disciplines, we can lend to the speed of which um, our communications can work, the, and of course the efficiency, because we're, we're on the same page, we're talking the same language, and we're using the same kinds of disciplines that our change management counterparts are using. So there's an inextricable link now between the importance of change and the importance uh, of employee communications. Yeah. Yeah. And I know when we spoke originally, you, you'd said, I think in my paraphrase, you'd said as I see professionals, if they don't understand change management, they're going to get left behind. And I, and I totally agree. And I think yeah. for me, there's an important distinction here, which is, which is what I would say. And I, I'm, I'm not, and this isn't a semantic thing. This is, I know I'm, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I know the pro sign model. And I, I, as I think I mentioned to you, I'm, I'm kind of very, I was when I worked at PepsiCo, and I know you worked at PepsiCo too. The part of PepsiCo I was in, we really uh, kind of invested in the Cotter model, which I, I think the two, mm-hmm. right. two, uh, two over, overlay really closely to each other. They're very similar DNA mm-hmm. to both of them, and 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 the, the whole, you know, for us, the, the the kind of thing was, you know, the change, leading change versus managing change. So for me, the manage managing changes, and I know this is a, again, it's 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 a semantic thing, and it's not it's not how everybody interprets it. But the, the thing there was a lot of. A lot of change management was about that kind of nuts and bolts project management. It was like, you know, the Gantt charts and that sort of thing. Whereas for me, it was the softer side of, of, of it was the lead where the leadership element came in, which is, you know, kind of a sense of urgency, which, you know, cor- correlates, I think, with awareness and desire with ADCAR yep. and, you know, and the third, the third and fourth stages of Cotter's model, which is sort of, you know, create the vision and communicate the vision, which is all about communication, you know, and it, it recognizes that. We're taking people through an emotional process here, not just a sort of rational, you know, you know, uh, market says this, we've got to do this. So for it's binary, you know, kind of, we just Mm -hmm. need to start, you know, and and I always used to say, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a famous quote. I can't remember where it came from, but, you know, sort of, um, you know, the soft stuff is the hard stuff. The hard stuff's the soft stuff. It, it's it's there's the ninety percent of change is about people, and and I think you know th- that for me is inherently about communication. I mean, from your experience with models, you know, whether it's ad cars we've said or whether it's Cotter or whatever, you, you know, the, the the is it is it the case that there are certain stages which where where communication is important, or is it actually you know they're just they're they're, they're intertwined. You can't separate the two; they're just one and the same. And you've got to yeah. be looking at it holistically. Is that your is that your take it, on it? It is, Craig. I mean, we're, what we're inevitably talking about is this is the human side of change. Um, to mm-hmm. your point, it's like we're in every part of the process, even in creating an awareness of the need for change. It's different than saying, okay, I'm aware that we need to change, but that doesn't mean I have the desire to do it. So I'm kind of following this ad car model. Mm, yeah. Right. And, and, and so that means someone's got to communicate to me in a way that makes me say, not only am I aware of it, okay, I'm going to change to help do it. Cause I believe, I believe in it. I believe in there's a reason for the change. And then, you know, we move we move into a lot of the training and development areas around, OK, so even if I'm aware and I and I believe that there's a reason to change, do I have the knowledge to actually do this? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I need yeah. to get, well, that's a communication you know, component as well. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, nothing ever happens um, with one communication. Reinforcement is a really critical part of any change model, uh, be it ProSci or anybody else. So every part of, of, um, of the change process, uh, no matter what model you use, is connected to communication. So I always say communication is the thread. It's the, it's the tie that binds the whole effort together. Mm. And if you don't have those pieces connected together, you, you more than likely will not succeed seed in your change efforts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. John. And if I can, yeah. if I can add to that briefly, I, I think the one, the one thing that is critical to all of this is, is that research component. Yeah. Uh, you know, making sure whether it's an internal or an external audience, you're, you're doing those pulse surveys or polling, or, you know, you, you've got the feedback loops that allow you to get a sense for what's going on with the people that you're trying to serve again, whether it's internal or external and letting that research help guide the effort. Uh, mm, mm, right. You know, we, we see employees all the time. They are, the research is out there. I actually, we actually had Richard Edelman here visiting yesterday from mm. Edelman and he was talking about the trust barometer and that more than ever before companies are actually the most trusted group of all communicators far more than the media, far yeah. more than anybody. And 
they've got a real posi- a real chance now to to make that change. It's just a matter of are they going to look at the research? Are they going to make the right steps? And are they going to are they willing to take that step to begin with? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I guess you you sometimes hear the, you know, you look at the, the Gallup data and how many people are engaged and disengaged and, and, and that never seems to change. But I do, I do think you're right. There, there is a vacuum of trust at the moment, isn't there? And and I think there is an opportunity for organizations to, to, to show authentically that, you know, what they're about and, and that they care and that they're not just saying it just to kind of, you know, kind of tick the boxes and, um and and get the you know get get the sort of the awards and the and the and the and the silver stars and all that sort of thing. So I think yeah, I think it's definitely a, a, an amazing uh, opportunity there. One one thing I I I'm interested in, and I know we kind of hadn't necessarily put this in our show notes that we were going to talk through, but I, I think one of the things that always c- comes out for me in where I see really effective change communications done really well is where it it is driving personal accountability and i think you know i think i think i think prosci and adcar do that really well because you know with a desire there's a kind of you know it's a choice you know you you you, if we can't we can't make you want this but we can give you all of the kind of um the data and the evidence and the kind of you know we can show you why we think this is the right thing to do but ultimately if you don't want to do that then you know maybe this isn't the right place for you you know and i think that building that personal accountability is really important because i think a lot of change communication sometimes has the opposite effect it's actually making us wrapping people in cotton wool and making people feel as though everything's fine and great and you know you can just you know it's almost like disempowering it's almost paternalistic maternalistic i mean what are your thoughts on that and i'm just you know i know i've plucked that one out of the air and we hadn't kind of planned to talk about this but i you know when you were talking about it it just struck me that for me where i've seen it done really well it does drive that personal accountability I, I think there's two things here. The first is um, uh, that kind of accountability happens n- not on an enterprise level mm. through communications, right? Mm. So when we think about strategically engaging employees, we have to be thinking not only about communicating to the full enterprise, but empowering uh, leaders and supervisors to have those direct one-on-one kinds of discussions mm-hmm. with, mm-hmm. with their team members or in and or with their their team. So I, I think that's um, really critical is that we can't expect that broad communications will get people to move the dial on their own. It simply sets the stage for them to entertain, okay, how can I, how would I, uh, support this level of change with my own work and my own my own job. Yeah, yeah. I think that the second thing is that um, this is this is really about as we said before the emotional side side of change, and we as communicators have the have the responsibility of helping connect individual and team activities to this broader picture. And so we talked a little bit, or John talked a little bit about storytelling is one of the chapters in the book. Mm. And the way we approach it is not just, you know, what is a good story and why are stories important, but it's how do you use a, uh, what we would call a master narrative yeah. to help connect um, all the independent threads of change into this, here's what we're going after. So mm. I, I think those are two elements that really help bring or foster um, uh, individual accountability and engagement in the broader change picture. So I I always say, you know, we're going to have the story and the story is the is the master narrative. And then we have many, many, you know, tens or or hundreds of a stories. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The proof points. Those are the individual change initiatives. But we have to connect them to the story so that it begins to make sense and you know, otherwise um, it's just a lot of activities that are being thrown at employees and they don't they don't understand and when you get overwhelmed and overloaded you're you're ten you you tend to check out <laughs> so yeah, yeah i think yeah. those are a couple of things that that really help um, support individual engagement yeah I, I'll, I'll come, I want to come back I want to come on to that and that, actually I was going to skip I'll probably we'll, we we're going to talk about capabilities I think we can probably cover that at the end because I think that's a good good maybe a good thing to conclude I do want to move on to storytelling because I think that's a nice lead into it into it Mark and and yeah I agree I mean you know one of the things that's what my company does with the big picture approach is we, we kind of show that you know we call it the lid of the jigsaw box is how all those bits fit together because often you know you've, you're faced with a pile of jigsaw pieces on the table and you don't know where where everything how everything connects 
mixed together, you, it's overwhelming and confusing, and you just tend to focus on your own little bit of the of the puzzle and and ignore the the rest around it. I know that's an area of your interest, John, and your research. Let, let's just move on then to this. The, the, the building on what Mark's just said about this kind of ma- almost like this master narrative, and then the, the sort of the sub stories that that feed into that narrative. Could you just talk a little bit about that, the significance of that, and also practical ways? Because I think there's a lot of I see lots of webinars and blogs about you know we you know we need to be great at storytelling, but I think there's a difference between telling a great story as an individual, but also then connect, telling a joined up connective single. You, you know, kind of coherent story within an organization. Do you, do you want to just build on some of those thoughts, uh, John? Because I know that's sure. your area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I talk about in my classes all the time that, um, you know, there's there's stories that you want to tell to create change. Uh, and there's stories you tell just for popularity. And popularity is mm. nice, but it's not going to create any kind of lasting effect. It's it's not going to move the needle at all. And And what you want with your stories is – you know, you're trying to inform somebody, you're trying to raise awareness, you're trying to create behavior change, you're trying to, you want your stories to do something. Mm. And I, I, th- I think what's really important to what, what enough, what pl- places need to do more of, and I found this a lot with, uh, on, on the health communication side, when I talk to folks at hospitals and other, other organizations, they're not really listening and they need to be listening to the people who they are serving and and the people who kind of serve them. So again, impl- internal and external audiences, what's important to them? What are the, you know, what do they need? What do they want? And then figure out what are the stories that can help them to get to where they need to be, but also serve that overarching message, the overarching goal of keeping things going, continuing to grow, continuing to move forward. Hmm. And, and I think for employee communicators, it's, it's finding that ear to understand those conversations and, and know when they're hearing something that's really poignant and important. Hmm. Um, so, you know, finding those stories that will drive action. Um, so we can, you know, do things like spurring sales and shaping a news release or, or getting stakeholders to comment and then, well, it's also feeding the beast. We all know about mm. how that goes, whether it's yeah. an internal newsletter or social media or the website. We've, we've got to have content. And there's just a wealth of content at your fingertips if you're willing to listen and look for it. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. And and, and uh, either of you, Mark or, or John, uh, when it comes to getting that 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 story because because you you said Mark there's there's you know there has to be a coherent consistent story if if I get one story from one person and it's a, they, then I get a different story from someone else that that's probably le- less helpful than having no story at all perhaps I don't know what w- what are some of the challenges that organisations face and that the internal community educators can help with when it comes to i'm not going to call it a single version of the truth because that sounds time too kind of orwellian but you know this kind of uh, this this sort of consistent joined up narrative where our noses are in the same direction and it's not just a kind of silo perspective on the story it it, it, it is that consistent broader narrative what what are some of the things that organizations need to be doing there to, to be effectively getting that one story together well, I, I think there's uh, quite a few things. Um, number one is helping them create that story. So I, I'm, I'm actually working now with a client that's going through um, a significant transition and really helping them um, connect the dots, right? So this um, they're already into the change process, but, but without the benefit of a, a master narrative that says so, something about why we're changing, what's mm-hmm. in it for employees, and in, in a compelling way, right, that engages, as I like to say, heads, hearts, and hands. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. But um, creating a story is not the beginning and ending of what employee communicators can do. Their, the next role is to help the organization understand how to use it, right, how to use mm-hmm. it in day-to-day communications, how to empower leaders, for example, to be better storytellers. But to, so there's two things there. One is like, you know, most of us aren't born as awesome storytellers. We mm-hmm. kind of have to learn it. And in, in most of our lives, there's probably a couple people that we go, oh my gosh, what a great storyteller. But mm-hmm. there's a reason that person has become a great storyteller. It's because they've really focused and understood, under, they, they've 
come to understand what makes a great story and how to tell it. As communicators, part of our job is to help people become better storytellers, right? Mm. So in many cases, they're aware of anecdotes in their own organizations that support their um, efforts to change, but they fall flat when they tell them because they don't know how to tell them in such a way that makes it personal and makes it real, makes it authentic for those who are listening. So we can help um, uh, leaders learn to become better communicators and storytellers. And then finally, we as employee communicators can get better at telling stories as well, right? And we can also get better at, um, uh, you know, using those stories consistently as we come across them or as we dig for them or mine for them in our ongoing communications. I think Mm -hmm. some of us tend to get the first story right and we're kind of, we rest on that for a while and let it, let it go. Mm -hmm. But a good story for change is one that has a lot of shelf life and not that it won't change or adjust over time, but it really is that North star that we use, we use as our guide for communications over longer periods of time during the change efforts. Yeah. So something you said there was re- really interesting. And, and, I, and, and, and again, it's a bit like, you know, a lot of people say, I can't draw. Um, yeah. I'm, not yeah. crea- I'm not creative. Yeah. I, I think actually, you know, I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with you. I think actually we're, we're probably born to be quite good storytellers, but we, we kind of have it educated out of us by, you yeah. know, but by, by, you know, school and by, by, by our experience in business and actually we can't we it's well it, i think often we can help people uncover that that latent yeah. skill i think i think you know if you look at human history it, it, it 95 of it is born around good storytelling that's how our, our knowledge was passed down wasn't it for, for most of our yeah experience. i mean many of us you know join the, the world of corporate communications from the world of, of journalism and so we're you know natural storytellers from yeah. that experience yeah i certainly found in my own career that the longer i got away from it it being the, the field of journalism, the less I was practicing yeah. you know, the, the great yeah. things in storytelling. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, in the book, actually, we talk about the science behind this, which is quite interesting. It's, it's based off a lot of research that uh, a professor at the University of Florida did. His name is Norm Holland about what happens when we hear the words, um, I'd like to tell you a story, and it mm. activates you know, the limbic system of the brain, which tends to you know, create order out of, out of chaos. And that's what stories do, right? Yeah, yeah. They create meaning. And so, you know, when we start with that, even in the book, it kind of creates a firm foundation of reminding us, and by the way, giving us ammunition to talk to executives <laughs> yeah. about yeah. why we want them to become better storytellers. So yeah. it, it's, it's a real thing. It's a physiological yeah. response to the words. I, I want to tell you a story. Yeah, yeah, and and, and we and we we use a technique which, which isn't. I'm not saying it's rocket science, but you know, it's almost. Incur- it's it, uh, people. People tell stories all the time in organisations. You know the kind of informal grapevine in the in the in the canteen or wherever they they con- congregate. They're always trying to telling each other stories, and I think it's 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 the stories they tell each other about the organisation that I always find really fascinating. And I and one of the things we do is is get people to tell stories where you know if we're rolling out values to an organization or if we're helping a client roll out the values is what 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 are the ways that people tell them self stories about what that value actually looks like and when we've seen ourselves at our best delivering that or living that value and i think it's always really interesting because if you can curate those really well and obviously there's a there's a kind of sometimes a definitional thing and and, and making sure that the, the the what their perception of the values is but if you can curate those really well they're far more powerful than stuff we kind of create in the boardroom and share you know if we can get stories about somebody who's just kind of completely gone out of their way to do something amazing for a customer or a client that is absolutely embodies what we're trying to talk about with this value that can be so much more powerful than something that you know we we've kind of carefully crafted and got the internal comms to sort of proofread and edit and almost vanillaize sometimes i think that you know it's mm-hmm. sometimes it's capturing and curating those that yeah. can be a real real uh, powerful moment um I don't know. You got that? That's anything you, you you've covered in the book or in your own practice? But uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's that's absolutely right. It gets back to the listening that I was talking about. Yeah. The, the stories are there, um, and and I think what we're we're in an era now where people people have a really good BS detector. Yeah, they know if something's real or not, and and they want to hear stories about people. They want to hear real uh, stories about real people. Mm. We've actually seen a bunch of advertising and PR campaigns focused on hearing from employees. A lot of uh, companies 
were thought of as just monoliths. Mm. You know, th- th- this is like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Southwest Airlines has done a pretty nice job with this where, you know, they had a pretty good reputation, but then they actually did an entire campaign a few years back where they told stories. They were listening to what people, why were people flying? Mm. And so they just told the stories of all the different people and why they were flying. And there was something everyone could identify to Mm. and it Mm. helped to humanize the brand. And I think the more that we can do that, the more that you can take a company, which may just seem like a box Mm. and turn it into something that that's humanized. I I think you, you gain affinity with both your internal and your external audience. They they think about you in a different way and you get people ideally who can then become brand ambassadors and talk about you even without being prompted about the good that you do and how good it is to work there and that sort of a thing. So there is so much power there that, um, can be tapped into again if you're listening and and you're willing to to activate it and activate it in the right way whether it's it's text or video or audio or a mix of those yeah yeah definitely definitely i want to move on just just as we sort of bring things to a conclusion for you i'd love to talk continue but i'm conscious that we we you know we need to keep this uh this to sort of a manageable conversation uh, one one thing we when again when mark and i spoke I'm, and i'm paraphrasing was he said that if a, an exec or a rising exec within an organization doesn't have a positive experience with an internal communicator by the time they get to director level we've kind of lost their attention you know we, we it's it's much more difficult to get them to appreciate and value um internal comms as a as a profession and as a sort of a, a critical friend and as a, as a as a as a business partner going forward um and that's uh, you know for me I, I i concur with that but also it has serious implications so what what can we learn from that and from your your that observation mark and then sort of you, you can add to that john maybe so, uh, so I think um, to your point, not or to my earlier point, not only are we talking about um, executives focusing on external comms, but also focusing on more tactical uh, communications. You know, mm. it's the classic "bring me my communicator; I have something to say." Yeah, <laughs> and that that is not what we want to have the as the relationship between employee communicator or any communicator and a senior leaders. I think the reality is that senior leaders only have so much bandwidth for learning how other staff functions work. I mean, think about their learning sales, supply chain, logistics, marketing, HR, blah, blah, blah. We have to think of management, um, general managers, even including um, out to manager level um, employees or who, who engage us. We have to think of them as students, right? <laughs> They're not going to understand or take the time to learn about what we can offer strategically as advisors if we're not educating them and taking them along for the ride. We're, we'll only be taken as strategic if we show up to that way, that way to them, mm-hmm. and we do it early and and often. So, I, I, it kind of goes back, uh, Craig, to to the value I think of this book, and and John and I mm-hmm. have talked so much about this that it, it's a holistic look at, at taking stock of where we are as a practicing communicator. So everything from the competencies that we've listed to the future influences and getting ahead of issues and helping organizations think through as a strategic partner versus, you know, hey, I'm waiting for you to tell me what you want me to say. That's mm-hmm. that that era is gone in terms of being able to um, affect a a, a a full chain a career as a employee communications professional. Mm. We, we've got to be more strategic. We have to lean into the issues that we see, and we've got to work to educate uh, management as as they grow through the, their own careers and and climb the ladder, so to speak. You know, part of part of what John and I have also talked about is getting this textbook into business schools. Yeah, um, we're we're not just thinking about employee communicators anymore. We're thinking let's start educating business professionals, future you know C suite leaders about how important it is that they understand this is a tool that will help them in their careers and help the businesses that they that they that they lead. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. And I think you know if you look at the evolution of you know kind of 
personnel to now human resources and and all of these these uh, these now sort of business partner functions within organisations. I think you know you can see how I remember when I did my my MBA a long long time ago. It was like really it was really kind of almost innovative and pioneering to have something about creative thinking and you know it was yeah, like you yeah. know rather than just balance sheets and net present value and things like that. So sure, sure. yeah yeah. What about what about what about you, John? Any anything to add to to that to to, to what Mark yeah. said there? Yeah. I'll, I'll chime in briefly. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, the old saying, you don't get a second chance at a first impression. I, <laughs> I think you have to understand who you're working for and with. You have to know what they value. And then you have to have the research to back up whatever your plan is. Mm. I, I don't think you can just go into it saying, I've always taken this approach. This is the approach I'm going to take. You have to know the individual and and get a sense for what are their goals how do you help them achieve their goals and yeah. and make sure that you are again I, i'm a huge proponent of research first second and third with everything that i do yeah yeah um and i i think that's kind of the way the world is now i think people want to see some kind of proof too often i won't get into social media is a mm. whole lot of fake things mm. hopefully if you're working for a company you can bring them again those the, the, the poll surveys and the other research you've done to say, look, this is a this is a problem or this is an opportunity. And here's what we need to do to get there. And and hopefully you are you're you're working to empower your um, your director level folks to to get there. And look, if it's it's very simple. If you make somebody look good, they're going to want to do more of it. Exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know, Mark, you and I kind of share, a, and I, I'm not sure which part of the business you worked in, but I, 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 I kind of earned my apprenticeship in, in management in a, in a, in a food factory. And, uh, you know, I, I think no more there were you kind of attuned to the fact that how important communication was. Cause if you didn't, yeah. if you weren't put, you know, kind of promoting a positive communication, there was the vacuum was always filled by other stuff, you know, and that's not to say PepsiCo was a negative company. It wasn't in any way, you know, it was a really fantastic company, fantastic workforce, but it kind of taught you that how critical it was to, to be an effective communicator, to be a decent manager, to be a decent leader, you had to communicate well. And that, that for me kind of, and I think you, it goes back to what you'd said is if you haven't had that experience and you just think you can, you know, manage just by keeping an eye on the numbers and, and, and the, you know, and the KPIs and forget, you actually have to communicate with people and interact with them as human beings. I think it can, uh, it's very difficult then to, to, to turn that ship around, I think. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, um, we, we skipped one question, which which we maybe we can just cover very briefly before we wrap up, which was I, I had a question to you about building capability in change and internal comms. And I know in that you mentioned in the book, there's a there's a kind of competency framework. And I, and I know we, we talk, Mark, about different other other competency frameworks I was familiar with. Just, 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 just to kind of wrap things up around that that kind of topic is there what you know you mentioned pro sci and there are you know other other brands exist out there if people do want to do it. is it is it that you you need to at the moment you need to skill up in two different ways you need to think oh, okay i need some ic skills i need some internal comp skills uh, as uh, some change management skills uh, it, what what is it how can people build their capability how can organizations build capability around that both formally and or sort of informally i know it's a very difficult question to answer briefly but i don't think you've got any tips <laughs> or thoughts on that um i i think it begins with understanding how does your organization approach change mm. there are some organizations that have adopted a particular model and we've talked about some of those but and if that's happened then i think employee communicators need to find the center of excellence or whoever is leading that um, that that those change uh, uh, discipline development mm. areas and become a part of that team um so that's step number 1 if there isn't an existing commitment to a particular change methodology, then I think it's up to the employee communicator to probably find a partner. Typically, it's going to be in HR because that's where most companies, if they're beginning a change management practice, um, they're going to they're going to find and create a center of excellence, typically in HR, and then often they'll, they'll kind of deploy that out to their operating parts of the business. Mm. Um, but it's a, it's an opportunity for employee communicators to actually step in and be a leader, a leading voice in this process versus 
is being you know brought in or dragging <laughs> being dragged in yeah. at some point later yeah so get in front of it i guess is the is the uh, recommendation that i would make um and then understand like why why is this important so the, the chapter in the book talks about the evolution there's a whole chapter on the evolution from employee communications to employee engagement yeah and it's all about change <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah so i think there's there's a lot of good uh, data in there that supports why this is important and there's a couple of different ways that you can get get started excellent anything anything to add to that john I think he summed it up quite nicely. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, I, 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 we've got a couple of th- final things just to cover before we, we wrap up. But, but I mean, just to, just to say thank you. I mean, the, the, t- the, the I think it was some really interesting um, information there, and obviously the book is 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 really kind of pivotal to to, to the pulling all of this together. But I think that it's been really great for 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 me for us to be able to bring this to our audience. As I say, it's something we haven't covered before. Where I think it's kind of in, been implicit in a lot of things we've talked. About. Out, um, but um, but but not explicit in terms of you know actually seeing change management, change leadership as a, as a competency that sits alongside that internal communicators absolutely need to be aligned with, and and then as a as a sort of a, a, a not an aside, but as a, as an, an additional layer around that, around how the importance of story and storytelling in that building that change narrative i think is incredibly um valuable and 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 a, and a and a wonderful thing to bring to 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 our listeners um just before we uh we talk about the final sort of you know how people can get in touch with you and how we can get hands on the book i i kind of pre-warned you um about the fact that i always ask my interviewee normally i've got the two of you this time interviewees something that um people who even people who work with you and know you reasonably well would be make oh right i didn't know you uh you did that you were into that you kind of did that when you were younger whatever it is something that you're willing to share obviously with a with a worldwide audience and uh, uh but but i, I don't know who which order we want to do it in so um i'll ask the question and then i'll let you decide who's going to answer so please something that we 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 uh, your colleagues your friends your family maybe don't even know about you but uh, you're willing to share with us who's going to go first <laughs> i guess i can go that's first. john okay <laughs> um, I, I, I will say my, my my family knows about this but most people don't uh i was actually a uh, a huge tennis player back in the day i played in in high school i played at university and then uh, played quite a bit after that. And uh, dream was always to be able to play on a grass court at Wimbledon. So still hoping for that whenever the pandemic ends. Uh, not not like in the tournament, just on, on yeah. a court would be yeah. plenty. Uh, but yeah, it is it is a passion of mine um, and something that I've done for the last, I, I guess, 40 years now. Uh, wow. But yeah, just huge, huge tennis guy. Yeah, my wife's been to Wimbledon about three or four times, but to watch, not to play. But, oh, but I, I'd take that. Yeah, but so did, did you? Have you played anyone we may have heard of, or would you? Oh, no, 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 no. no. Okay, never, okay. I, I'm not going to. I was never that good. I no, mean, okay. I, I played at a, a small university, um, but it was it, it, it was some of the best times. Uh, just getting to be out on the court, and it, it's great because you can be a you, you play solo. I mean, you know, with singles, it's it's on you, but you're still yeah. part of the team. And yeah. for me, it's the perfect mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As someone, I think it's one, tennis always is one of those things where you, you when you watch it on the TV, you think, oh, that looks really easy. And then you kind of put a, you know, and, and I've, I've lost innumerable tennis balls whenever we played with the kids. You know, it was like, Dad, stop hitting it so far. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but no, excellent. No, no so th- that's brilliant. John, thank you. Mark, over to you. Yeah, so I, you know, mine is is similarly a sports related uh, activity. Uh, I don't think most people would know that I am a three time uh, USA national uh, title holder for amateur wrestling in a master's level competition. So wow. this is where you compete against um, you people your own uh, age, in your relative to your age group and your uh, your weight. And uh, I actually uh, won my third title this past uh, April. And, uh, and I'm also a, a, a USA Wrestling, which is the national governing body of amateur wrestling, not, not the professional off the yeah. top of that guy, but yeah. um, a That's body of, U, of amateur wrestling. And I'm a cer- silver certified coach. I, I coach at a couple of different clubs. So probably oh, not cool. something most people think about, you know, the communicator. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And, and, and I, I don't, I'd be careful how I phrase it. Are we talking about 
proper wrestling here we're talking about yes yeah, yeah. yes we are <laughs> yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. So yeah this is these are competitive um you know matches uh, as you would see you know um, in collegiate or high school competitions here in yeah. the u.s and yeah there's different styles for the olympics as well so, yeah, yeah 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 definitely and and oh, yeah incredibly you know physical and strong sport I, i've seen <laughs> i've seen you know the kind of WWF and I've seen the proper wrestling and you know I I, I can see there's a miles of difference it, big, yeah, big yeah. difference yes, big exactly. big difference big big difference yeah, we, we, I, it, I think a promotional match with Hulk Hogan for the book sounds good though Mark yeah yeah what a, what a, all right set it up John we'll go what a great publicity stunt you might you probably be able to beat him I mean he's easy I don't know yeah but but, uh, but I remember I mean I don't know whether you know but in the ph- uh, phenomenon in the UK miles before WWF in the UK when I grew up as a kid I'm probably age myself on a Saturday afternoon they used to have you know wrestling from such and such a place some small town in the UK and it'd be a ring surrounded by you know old ladies and with you know kind of blue rinse and sort of you know sort of shouting and there'd be these two (laughs) guys sort of you know doing uh, sort of all the theatrics but very very basic compared with WWF so I, I kind of grew up on that type of wrestling which was some of I think there were some really good wrestlers in there who were proper wrestlers and then there was the kind of you know just sort of um really big guys who sort of you know the kind of star spangled sort of uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 but uh yeah but well, that was fascinating well I, I didn't expect that and that's definitely two definitely two firsts for the show in two two for the price of one so that's brilliant <laughs> uh, so look more down to more serious issues where where can people get hold of the book when can they get hold of the book and how can they reach out with you guys i was going to put your um your linkedin profiles into the show notes so people can find you that way uh do you have a website for the book what, what tell is all about the book and how we can get a hold of it we we do uh, the website is uh engaging i'm sorry engage hyphen employees.com engage hyphen employees.com and uh, the book is available on amazon as well as through rutledge our our publisher and uh the actually the website has multiple ways of securing your copy it is actually shipping already so uh it started shipping i think uh, september 30th so it is off and running and, and hopefully everybody can get their their copy pretty quickly Okay, and I'll put the link in the uh, we'll put that link in the show notes to the to the website. And is that is that going to be global availability US? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Through Amazon as well. Yeah, okay, yeah. That, that's the sort of uh, the world's bookstore at the moment, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and, and everything else store. Um yeah, uh, any uh, yeah, great. And, and uh, okay to share your your LinkedIn profiles. I don't know whether you guys have any personal websites or you you know you you I would be more happy to put links into those as well if you wish. I mean, maybe you don't you, you can read them out or we can just stick them in the show notes. Uh, it's up to you. Sure. LinkedIn's great. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And I've got, I have my, uh, my uh, consultancy website, northstarcoms.com, but I can send that to you. We'll pop that into the show notes as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank wonderful. You. Wonderful. Well, look at that. I'm, I, I've really enjoyed that conversation. I was really looking forward to, I look forward to all of my interviews, but, but it, it, you know, it's to cover an area we've not covered before and, and to be able to talk to you about, you know, about body of work with like the book and, 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 uh, and I, I, th- I genuinely, you know, I'm, I, I think there's a, a big gap in the market for, for, for a piece of work like this. And I, and I can see, you know, lots of opportunities and I'll, I'll be, I said to you, Mark, I've got a few contacts that I'll put you in contact with, you know, aside from the, yeah. uh, this conversation. Well, Craig, I can't thank you enough for your interest in the book, for this wonderful conversation and really for helping us uh, spread the word about what we hope will be a tool that everybody can use to get better at what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And thank you guys and, and stay safe and uh, hopefully uh, looking forward to, uh, the, you know, the end of this year and a, and a good, good start to 2022. Sounds Amen good. to Take that. Care. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Thanks thank guys. You. Take right. care. Thank you. So thank you very much for listening to Engaging Internal Comms. We hope you found this episode useful and interesting. We'd uh, love to get your thoughts about the show and any questions you have or ideas for topics that you'd like to maybe cover in future episodes. You can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can get in touch with us via the contact form at engagingic.com. You can also sign up for our mailing list there and we'll send you relevant news about the show, future episodes, and we'll also let you know about anything interesting we found out about internal communications and employee engagement. 
Uh, if you like the show and you haven't already done so, please subscribe to it via your podcast service. And you can also subscribe via the links on our podcast page, which again is engagingic.com. If you like the show, we'd be really grateful if you could leave us a review. And if you know anyone else who might be interested in the show who might benefit from it, please let them know. Please share it with them and share them the uh, with them the links to the show and engagingic.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.